Hey, Ezra Firestone here with a special guest, someone who you know. His name is James Shramko, ladies and gentlemen. How you doing, James? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for catching up again, Ezra. It's always a massive joy in my life. Oh, thanks, man. Well, I've got something to admit to you that I have not admitted to anyone. I hadn't even admitted it to myself until just now, (laughs) which is I believe I am officially uh, an espresso addict. I think I'm like fully like to the point where like this could potentially be a problem. I mean, not a problem, but it's like, here's the thing. I discovered coffee two years ago and or three years ago now. And like, I kind of got really into it. And now like I drink two espressos every morning and I don't know if that's good or bad. I haven't, I got to do some research on how much of this stuff you should be drinking, but like, I love it. It tastes so good. It's so much fun. The ritual of it, James, it's not even the stimulant side of it because I can drink an espresso and go to sleep. Like it doesn't affect me the way it affects most people. Cause I'm already like super hyper, I guess, but the, the ritual of it, the, the grinding of the beans, the tamping it into the portafilter, the putting it inside of the machine, the watching it pull, the aroma of it, the tasting it, the steaming the milk, the whole ritual of making espresso I'm in love with. And to go even further, I've spent quite a lot of money on this uh, addiction of mine. And um, I've gone ahead and upgraded my espresso machine to something pretty fancy. I don't think it's a, a bad thing. I mean, you could be a top fuel dragster or an ocean going race boat addict or, you know, no heroin or something. It's, it's coffee. I think it's okay in moderation. And there is some evidence I think to support that it could give you a, a nice feeling that will give you some alertness. I mean, they do forbid over caffeine intake for athletes because i think it might give them a performance advantage oh and there's also i don't know if you've found about this one yet but you can have caffeine sleeps as well interesting i have not found that's where where you have a a shot of caffeine and then you go and have a nap and you'll have these really awesome dreams wow i gotta try that i gotta get into that i got uh, i got into this company called clive coffee they've got an um a youtube channel and i like watch all their videos and learn about espresso and like uh it's kind of interesting uh going to what you teach you know they do basically um uh, own the race course right they've got me on their content and like a year later i've been consuming their content for a year and in the last uh month i've spent like uh maybe three grand with them i, I upgraded from my breville dual boiler to their machine i upgraded from my barazza vario grinder to their grinder and uh and it's it's amazing like it's so much better <laughs> that's it i've got the pro grinder and i'm on my second uh espresso machine an italian one and I've also got the the cold brew drip coffee maker that Jared Robinson bought for me. And nice. I've got the stove top and then of course the, the French press. Yeah. So we've different lost our kinds of beans. We're, 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 I, I think we're it's crazy. okay. We've, we've gone. Haven't you built a whole business around it? Well, not yet, but oh, oh, I did. Yeah. Well, I didn't build a business around it. I partnered with a guy and then I got out of it because it just, I didn't have the capacity, man. I got enough stuff to do. The last thing I need is to start trying to sell coffee. It's like, you know what? No. I would have been the one to say that, uh, dude. You like, were the with, one to say that. You st- were the one <laughs> stick to with this. Stay in your lane. <laughs> yeah. You totally did say that. Now, speaking of you telling me stuff, that's actually what this podcast is going to be about. So, I asked you to come on because you wrote a book and that book is called work less and make more. And I think it is the best dang book that has come out this in 2017 um, for business owners. And I don't say that lightly. And obviously I'm a big fan of yours and you've helped me a lot and you've like, you know, coached me throughout the growth of my companies. And like, I believe in your coaching and, and, you know, obviously you've got a bunch of students and you're super successful, but like, I think one of the things that is popularized in entrepreneur culture is this, like, you've got to be, working all the time and you know you've figured out a life that not a lot of people figure out which is you make seven figures and you also like have time to surf and have time for your family and you're not totally busy and like um what i'm curious about number one go buy james's book work less make more i'm going to put a link under this post it is a phenomenal book and um what i want to know is a little bit about like for folks who maybe don't know your story like the journey man you know um because there was a time in your life where you weren't working less and making more you were working more and making less <laughs> yeah well you know it was a gradual progression of getting a job and making more and getting a better job and making more and getting a better job and making more i went through this progression from 
uh, my first jobs sort of part time, I don't know, prob- probably gardening weeds for my mum in the backyard and then lawn mowing. But then I, my first real job in an office full time was as a debt collector on the telephones. And I think my salary was $18,500 a year. This is in 1991. And from there, I kept increasing my wage. I, I went from there to a finance company. I got all the way up to 27500 And then I went to a, a technology company and I was earning $35,000 a year. And that's when I started having kids. And I was only about uh, 24 when my first kid came along. And I was on $35,000 a year and my wife was on $35,000 a year and she was stopping work. So I realized I had to make a lot more money and I got into sales. I convinced someone to hire me after getting rejected by Toyota. Mm. I got a job with BMW and I only did it on the basis that I could earn double my salary. I needed to make in the 70s as an income and juiced up on Brian Tracy's Psychology of Selling CDs and other resources (laughs) Yeah, that my uh, sales team had given me when I was an administrator. I got into the sales role. Within a year, I was the top BMW salesperson in Australia. Two years later, I switched to Mercedes-Benz, kept increasing my income. I went up to 115,000, then 127,000. And then I got a management job in the same dealership and I went to 145,000. And then I was approached to go and be a general sales manager at another dealership and I was on 200,000 and then 225,000. And then I became a now, general let me ask manager. You, during all this time, are you, how many hours a week are we talking that you're working here? Uh, look, in the car industry, Ezra, most of these places that I was working are open seven days a week. And it's, it's, not, it's not like you're not working when you're on a day off because as you elevate up the ladder, you become responsible for more and more. Mm. So in my last job, the dealership was open seven days a week. I was responsible for over 70 staff in a dealership that was generating around $50 million a year. Wow. We had big targets to achieve. So you, you never really switching off. And of course, for the last two and a half years, I was doing my online business at home after hours between 9.30 at night and 2 or 3 in the morning. So for the last couple of years, I was a general manager on nearly $300,000 a year and I was doing my little affiliate marketing business on the side. And my big dream, my big ambition was that I could get rid of the day job and have my own business perform well enough that I could just do that. And it took me a while to do that actually took me about nine months till I even made any income. And that was $49.25 affiliate commission uh, when I accidentally bought through my wife's affiliate link. Isn't that funny how we always and, remember the first sale? Oh, it like, was no so hard. I just remember how hard it was. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. And I, I remind my students now, you know, they see people like you, like $26 million a year, and they see people like me making uh, good money and they sometimes forget where we started, but I'm sure you started with started some from difficulty. The bottom, now we're here. Dude, I started with <laughs> yes. I started yes, with zero, I working 80 hours a week in a 300 square yeah. foot apartment. Yeah. So I was just, you know, I was in a pretty unhealthy situation where I was burning the candle at both ends and uh, my health was declining and I knew I had, it was like I was in a tunnel and I had to make a break for it or go back. I was either retreat or go forward at full speed and maybe hit a train. And I went forward. I just had this innate belief that I could do it. I did escape the clutches of full-time employment. It was not easy. And since then, I've seen some of these people come along. Uh, I've seen young single guys talking about working long hours, like sleeping under their desk in sleeping bags. And then I've seen... Um, stoic individuals, um, immigrant types who have this work ethic and stuff. And they're on camera with these deep black eyes, you know, like they hadn't had enough sleep. They look unhealthy and they're preaching, you know, work 19 hour days. Uh, And in, in one guy's interview, he said, if it came down to work or spending time with the family, my family know I'll always choose work. And I'm thinking, what a sad fuck. 
anyway, um, because I, mean, I was in a position, tough, man. that's tough. When I, I was in this position where I had four kids, I had a mortgage on a house in Sydney, which is one of the most expensive cities to live in. And I don't say that as a snob. I'm just saying that's where I grew up and I wanted to stay. I didn't want to compromise and move out to the country. Um, I'm not some 22 year old who can move to Asia and spend $500 a month on living costs. I had a, a, you know, a real challenge there to maintain a, a standard of living that I th- wanted to provide for my family and I made it through there. So really my book is just compressing a lot of the lessons that I learned and I put them into the most digestible, actionable, useful format possible and I dedicated the, uh, the book to my kids because I wanted to give them this book and say, hey, this is what your dad went through. Here's the lessons all in, in the shortest possible format. Read this and hopefully you can trim a few years off your own life curve of you know, experience wanna, and difficulty. I love that because it's like, look, this is my experience. This is what I went through and now I'm documenting it for you. And what, what I think is um, kind of interesting is like you don't hold st- like this content in this book is it's your content. It's good stuff. It's not like you're holding anything back. And I want to jump to two. Um, I want to jump to chapter three and four, which is 64, four and building a team, because I feel like mm-hmm. those two concepts are, I mean, they're, they're obviously big ones that I took from you um, that have really helped me. I mean, my team is huge now and I'm very efficient with my energy input output. So could you kind of unpack those a little bit to just use the parlance of our time, um, 64, four and team building and kind of your, some of your thoughts on those subjects? Yeah, I got a lot from 8020. I read about it in Four Hour Work Week. I was familiar with Richard Koch's book. And then Perry Marshall later wrote a whole book about it as well, which he sent me to read. And I liked that too. But the whole concept is that there's only a few things that matter and the rest of it isn't important. And I'd actually experienced that in my own career. There was just some customers who would buy a lot and other ones would waste a lot of time and not buy anything. And we've just got to stop treating things equally. So as entrepreneurs, we tend to see the opportunity in everything, whether it's coffee business or, uh, you know, marketing business or, or face cream. There's so many potential things we could turn our machine towards. It's a matter of figuring out which ones are better. So being curious with the 80, 20, I read that it's fractal and that means that you can apply it to itself and it keeps working as you keep going into it. Like, so I'm, I'm calculating what if you 80, 20, the 80, 20, and this is what I came up with that only 4% of the things you're doing are actually generating almost two thirds of your results. That means if you had an e-commerce store, there's a chance that just a few of your items or SKUs, whatever you call them are generating the lion's share of your income. And there's a whole bunch of other crap that doesn't do anything. And that was certainly true of our parts department at the dealership. We had millions of dollars worth of physical stock in a warehouse that was sitting on a shelf doing nothing. Yet every day we would sell uh, brake parts, uh, filters, umbrellas, if you can believe. We sold so many umbrellas, it was ridiculous. Ooh, that's Uh, an interesting market. then you'll get weird parts that someone ordered by mistake or it's for an obscure model and no one ever orders. It just sits there and then you end up with this situation of obsolescence where you have to just write it off. So I've seen what happens. Uh, so anyway, 4% of the things you are doing are getting 64% of the results, which means that you could safely remove, delete, uh, stop doing things that you thought were important and there would be no negative impact on your business. In fact, it could have a tremendous positive impact. And one of my go-to coaching techniques is to help my students do less. And that really is where the book delivers on the promise. You you know, I remember us sitting in a little hut there in Hawaii, surrounded by exotic surf craft on the walls, which I wish we'd done something about. I know. That's just uh, saying to you, Ezra, why aren't you just... (laughs) Why aren't you just doing more of this um, boom stuff? You know, put it under different labels, sell it through different channels. You're so good at it. I'm surely you could just sell more of it. And and this is where the power is. If we just stay in our lane and, and just mash the accelerator and not worry about all the side turns we could take, which potentially lead us to 
uh, no no real outcome other than wasting time and fuel, you know? Deep rather than wide, man. It's such a good strategy. Now, one of the things that you kind of go into before you go into 80-20-64-4 is um, your effective hourly rate. And I think that this is a, it's like, like this is something that I had never heard of before when I had heard of 80-20, but it's kind of good because it gives you that sort of, um, the way of sort of figuring out what activities really should you be doing and what activities should you get someone else to do. So it's kind of a nice lead in. Can you just talk about that for a minute? Yeah, because if you say 80, 20 or 464, um, people are going to say, yeah, but how do I know which, which ones are better? Uh, so effective hourly rate is simply a scoring system because we can track time. The first step that I like to do is actually take a note of what we're spending our time on. I recommend installing software, something like Rescue Time. If you're spending a lot of time on a desktop computer, it will show you where you spend your time. If you have uh, different products within your product suite and some of them take up more time uh, than others, then you can actually calculate how much profit is coming from that product line and how many hours are required to generate that profit. And you can simply calculate um, a profit per hour rate. So if you had a coaching business, an e-commerce store, and uh, say an affiliate side income, you could actually work out how many hours you spend on that and how much money you generate. And it might point to one of them being extremely profitable and another one being reasonably profitable and another one sometimes you're actually paying to have that business division. One of the, just a side note, is one of the terrifying things about rescue time is you discover how much time is spent in email and Facebook and it's shocking. <laughs> the email is like the black hole of productivity where um, it's simply a to-do list that other people get to add things to, which is why you have to be so careful who you give your email address to. As soon as you start entering marketing funnels under the uh, false reasoning of, oh, I just want to see what they're doing, that's like a downward spiral. You start clicking on their things. You get intimidated by how clever they are and how well they're going. You, you follow their funnels. You start buying things, trying a different model altogether, and you've wasted all that time and energy. And then social media. I mean, when I was in this work phase, Ezra, I didn't know that people just sit there and look at YouTube videos all day long or uh, mess around on Facebook, which is why I've avoided putting my business on Facebook because it's the last place I want to go to be productive. I go there to let off some steam or to see what people are up to or to do some marketing to attract people to my business. But I am also super conscious that you could potentially go there and, and forget why you even went there in the beginning. 100%. And then, it happens all the time. You know, an hour or two now. later, you're like, what have I done today? Uh, totally. So one thing that I do is I journal what I do each day. At the end of each day, I just post a few bullets in my silver circle community for my members, like what I did today. And I found just doing a little daily reconciliation keeps me pretty disciplined in terms of where I spend my time. But there's one thing that I do every single day and that's surf and having that routine pinning my day around that, uh, that, that is what keeps me from being a workaholic or a dull, boring, uh, you know, grinder or hustler whatever you want to call them. Yeah, it's important to have hobbies and activities and things that you're interested in outside of work or you're only going to work all the time. And the other thing I was going to comment on in the social media thing is they're now saying that the um, addiction to social media, to the the feedback that you get, like, uh, well, I don't know what they're calling it, um, and uh, that's their endorphin rush or whatever it is that you get when someone likes one of your things, is more addictive than sugar and even some drugs, like heroin and stuff, that, like, it's just so hard it, to it, kick it, it, I think it'll be like uh, the asbestos in, in 10 years time from now, they'll be revealing even more research about how terrible it is for your uh, personality, for your relationships, for the way that, that for your self esteem, we're only seeing these curated lives. Or then there's people who I think potentially overshare and they're just sharing all this tragedy and woe. And uh, anytime there's bad news, it's right in your face on social media. So um, I actually would recommend people to limit the amount of time they spend on it, not because I'm some conservative old prude, but I, I came from a generation 
before your generation where we didn't have mobile phones when we were teenagers. <laughs> like we would be out riding our BMX bike or going down sailing or um, hanging out at a friend's place, playing Lego or whatever. Like we didn't have this thing in our hand from the time it came out of the womb. And I think I possess a skill or a discipline of being able to concentrate on things without electronic um, interference, you know, for periods of a time. So often I don't even know where my phone is. It's, it's you know, there's a, uh, there's a new service now that comedians like Dave Chappelle and Hannibal Burris and Joe Rogan are using, which uh, is this service that when you come into one of their shows, it, they will take your phone and put it in a bag that you cannot open uh, unless you like get a phone. If you get a phone call, you still get a phone call. Your phone still works. You can take it outside. They'll open it and you can engage with it outside of the venue. And what they're finding is that like people are way more engaged and they're paying way more attention. It's just like way better than folks just like taking pictures and being on their camera and texting people and this and that. So, um, you know, but when I go down to my surf every day, to your life. I, I walk down the path and I walk from the path across the beach to the water and, and everywhere on the beach it's just like teenagers in the sand on their towel instagramming pictures looking at their phones there'll be like six people six young people there all looking at their phone not talking to each other i'm thinking well, why even bother <laughs> like why don't you just lie lie in your backyard with your phone because people are just not participating and i think there's a real world out there for people when they put the phone down. And there's a quote in the book that something along the lines of um, success isn't when you're at the beach with your laptop. Success is when you're at the beach with your surfboard. I mean, let's have some time away from the device. It actually makes your business more profitable. You will get creative ideas. When you do get back in front of that device, you can be super effective because you've been savoring, you're building up an appetite for it. You can destroy it you know using your best energy when you're on so when my appointments are on like i'm talking to you now i'm focused on that there's no phone in sight just you me a microphone and our best energy 100 percent. you know you uh work is going to fill the time that you give it and you need those silent you need that like that space because you know what i found i've been my wife is uh, Carrie, you know her, but um, some folks don't. She's into meditation and um, she's gotten me into these like um, multi-day sort of digital detox, no technology, mostly silence, mostly isolation, not a ton of food, these experiences where you kind of go inward. And what I find is that every time I do that, there's a kind of creation that is available only in that spot of no stimulation. If you're constantly being bombarded with just like Facebook and this and that, you don't have the space to really go deep in your thoughts. And uh, it's such a such a, a really great practice. I think if you're if you're listening to this and you're not doing any kind of digital detox, maybe add a day or two every six months where you just kind of take a break. You know, we have um, we have a, what we call no work Saturdays. We don't work Sundays either, but like we're just not on our devices on, on the weekends for the most part. You know, we we're off our devices at around 7 p.m. You know what I mean? Like we just have we kind of we break we break state from the digital world, you know, and it's helpful. <laughs> That's good. If you can do it every day, then uh, there won't even be a need for a detox because you've got a, a routine that you could sustain for the next 10 years. That's usually one of my tests. Could I do this for the next 10 years, which is how I've built my business model it's how i build my friendships and relationships they have to be sustainable because there's there's not much effort involved if you don't have to keep chopping and changing these things can we um i agree with you i want to switch to the, to the last kind of subject i want to touch on which is one of the things that you've been really successful in doing is building a community of people who actually help one another out and you have i think arguably the best online marketing forum that exists today uh, for business owners where people can go and like actually have conversation about like, Hey, I'm doing this thing. What do you think? And get like real successful, actual business owners responding to them and having like in-depth conversations and sharing their experiences, you know? And, um, I wonder what two things, number one, um, why you lean towards subscription revenue because you talk about that in the business and how you coach people in relationship to subscription revenue. And number two, um, who is that community right for? 
Okay, so subscription revenue, I like that model because it's a sustainable model. It takes out the lumpiness of the, the peaks and troughs that you might experience if you have a one-time product, um, product launch style business. It certainly has a place as promotions and you can still have promotions for a subscription business. But I do like having a recurring income. I think I've had six-figure income months every single month for the last seven years. Oh my goodness. And I like not having to wonder if I'm going to be able to pay the bills. I yeah. like being able to have team members who have been with me for eight years. I like uh, having more money coming in than going out just in general. So the recurring subscription model makes sense. The enemy of subscription model is churn. That's people who leave. So if you can get churn under control, it means that I can spend most of my energy looking after my existing customers instead of chasing new ones or trying to figure out a new technique or worrying too much if Facebook shuffles around their algorithm. Uh, because every time that happens, you see people panic and that's because they are super dependent on getting new customers. But of the five areas you can focus on your business, getting new customers is not really the, the best payoff. Generally, it's improving the frequency having multiple sales for the same customer or increasing the lifetime value of the customer. So that is why I like the subscription model. But I also, from a personal standpoint, I like developing that relationship that I have with my best customers over the years. Some of these people have been to 11 or 12 of my events. I go and see them at local meetups in different states and different countries. And I know my customers quite well. And there's nothing that replaces that kind of research where you are face to face with a customer in the same way that I see you every now and then in a different place here and there, but we're always reconnecting and we have a much deeper relationship than if it was just a virtual relationship over Skype. Totally. Absolutely. And that forum, man, it's so powerful because you got real people responding to you. I mean, this isn't just meant to pitch all your stuff, but like uh, I think forums are like a really good, uh, something that people forget about where it's like, if you need support, it's better than a Facebook group, frankly, um, I think. Well, I so. think yeah, to answer your question, uh, who it's for, I mean, look, this thing's been around since before Facebook groups. So I guess I created the community that I have as a solution for what I thought was missing. And what I thought was missing was, yes, there was forums and there was places you could buy information products. And they often talk about a retention of three months being the normal membership and that's because they had pretty crappy support my real bugbear is that the person who starts the community never shows up they're not there um, and you could probably apply this to most facebook groups often the person who started the group is not there they their first thing they want to do is extract themselves from it and appoint um, administrators or or people to service the customers while they're off doing whatever else they do in my case, I show up and I think that's a big differentiator. Uh, and the second point of that is I'm able to actually customize the information for people according to their own situation. I'm not leaving it up to them to try and interpret a generic training. I might point them to checklists and frameworks and specific trainings and then we can talk about how it applies to their business. And I'll also follow people up, find out how they're going and keep them accountable. So it genuinely is a coaching environment where I want them to succeed because that gets rid of the churn challenge for me. And that's why we have members staying there for two or three years, not for two sure. or three months. And I think that is one of the ways that you're unique is that you actually go in there and respond to posts. And the other thing that you just mentioned that I forgot about is frameworks and standard operating procedures is something that you are phenomenal at. And I don't think you realize how valuable that is to ongoing business process. And I think that's one of the things that in my estimation has made you as popular as you are is like, you can take ideas. It's like, there's a lot of people who teach, but there's not a lot of people who teach really well. And, and I think part of one of the reasons why you're as popular as you are as a coach and as a teacher and as someone who runs a forum is because you have that unique ability to just kind of framework and systematize and standard operate like somewhat complex, complex processes, you know? Well, I do like to simplify the complex, uh, but also I know if something's going to be done more than once, it's worth documenting. So for that reason, I've always taken notes on all the coaching calls. I like recognizing patterns. I guess I would say it's, it's like um, Charlie Munger's mental models. If I can see 
a pattern or an algorithm that I know works, then I would like to share that with other people who might also get benefit from it. That's why uh, in the higher level group, Silver Circle, which you're a member of, where I'm working with people who have quite substantial sized businesses, the patterns that work for one in a bass guitar market might work really well for someone who's in the uh, skincare market where they're not applying it or they can get this innovation rapidly. So having a core group of people at a, of a similar level business, being able to cross pollinate has been useful and therefore it's worth documenting that and getting contributions um, from that data set. So I guess we're capturing data across a whole bunch of people. And if you look at super fast business, I think there's a 800 coaching threads in my private section where I'm, coaching people individually for their own situation. And most people just can't believe that it, that it's true. They don't believe that I'm going to be able to do that. Yeah. They're like, and who is this imposter James Shramko? It can't actually be him. <laughs> well, it's not like that. They just don't think they can actually use that section unless they pay more because they feel it would be just un, unrealistic for that amount of value to be offered for the price that I charge. So over time I've been, raising my rates a little bit to try and get that back into step with, um, you know, basically to slow down the number of new intakes to a really manageable level so that I can deliver a good product. Because I believe if your product's really good, you don't have to worry about tricky sales techniques. The the product will uh, hold people into it, give them a great return, and they're not going anywhere. And then they actually tell people about it. And this means you don't need to do big launches. You don't need to worry about affiliate programs. You don't have to drive a you know, crazy amount of traffic in a desperate spike because you get some bill due. Like everything changes. It removes compromise. Yeah, it's a really good strategy um, looking at that, how you can implement repeat business. So, uh, you know, I'm a fan of keeping these somewhat short and going about 40 minutes now. So I'm just going to say one more time, you can uh, click the link under this podcast and purchase James's book, Work Less, Make More. If you don't read, um, you really ought to because what it gives you kind of gets your brain working in a different way than consuming audio or video content. It's worth giving a shot. James, you have an audio version of this book or a video version or any other way people can get it, download a PDF, something like that. I actually read an introduction for the book, like the whole introduction chapter on my podcast. So that would be a good way to ease into it. And I'm currently making the audible version. Nice. So what's a URL people can go to if they're not on my website when they're listening to this? Uh, superfastbusiness.com forward slash book or just go to Amazon and search for Work Less, Make More by James Shramko and that's S-C-H-R-A-M-K-O. So superfastbusiness.com forward slash book or go to Amazon, search for James Shramko, Work Less and Make More. Um, James, thanks for everything you've done uh, to support my business and the growth of my business. And uh, I sure hope that folks go out and get your book because it's really good, man. Good job. Well, thank you for executing on all the things we talk about. You're like uh, a dream scenario for someone who helps businesses where you've got an enthusiastic participant with uh, you know the ability to go out into the marketplace, innovate, pioneer. You're a tremendous leader to our market and you deserve all the success you're getting. Thanks, man. Yeah, I mean, people probably don't know this, but like Smart Marketer that you're listening to now exists. It's, 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 a, it's your model. It's, it's own the race course. I mean, look, I got the model for Smart Marketer directly from you. I remember um, when I, you had this sales video or you had this sales page. It was like you were going to bring a group of business owners together and show them this like system. It was two days in Australia and like you'd, you'd broken it all down and it was like a sales, sales event. And it was, you were only charging two grand if I remember. Um, mm-hmm. remember that? It was a, the first and only own the race course live training. Yes. So I wanted to come to that so bad, but at that time, I don't think I could afford it. Like I think it was like the plane ticket <laughs> and the ticket price and the whole thing. And I was like, I couldn't do it, you know? Um, and I was bummed because like, I was like, this is the thing that I want. Like I felt, I just had some kind of like, I just knew that was like, I needed to learn that thing. I, I read the sales page and I was like, this is what I need for what I'm trying to do. Um, and then what happened was 
I think I ended up selling my e-commerce business, coming into some money and joining Silver Circle as one of the things I did with that money and then running into you at a live event where I was like, listen, dude, that, that event you held in Australia, you need to just teach me that. And you were like, okay, sweet. <laughs> and that's kind of how it happened. Yeah, I remember you actually said, look, I don't know if you will, but I'd love, you know, I've got this domain smartmarketer.com and I want to do what you've done with super fast business. And you were concerned that I may not teach you, that I might have a limiting belief that there's not enough room for both of us in the marketplace. Yeah. I mean, well, at that time, I don't think I really fully understood what you did. And I thought maybe we were doing, going to be doing the same thing, but it's like, obviously we do completely different stuff, but. Well, I, I like to think that I can see a future version of people when I'm dealing with them. And I could absolutely tell you, you had something special as well. You had a spark and uh, that's why I immediately said we should do a podcast together because I knew you were going places and I'm a good talent spotter having hired hundreds of salespeople. Seedling. <laughs> look at you now i think you probably i think technically could be the most successful student that's come out of that program from where you started to where you are now it's been yeah i mean look at on the race course on boom, right boom yeah went from a couple hundred grand to 20 million a year in that time span and a couple hundred grand a year to 20 million a year uh largely on the backbone of on the race course it's not bad not bad at all. I mean, listen, I'm happy with it, right? <laughs> um, all right, man, I'm going to call this. Thank you so much. Uh, superfastbusiness.com forward slash book or amazon.com. Search for make, uh, Work Less, Make More uh, with James Schramko.